Um, all right. Um, my name is Lasse. I'm from Track. Uh, where? Uh, where I'm the legal advocate. Uh, I have been there for around two years. I think I'm the one who has done the most uh, full representations of additional rent increase for capital expenditures in the province, at least for every anyone else. I hope I am. Um, uh, so I would say I have a fair bit of experience with this topic. Um, so uh, additional rent increases for capital expenditure. Um, it's kind of the new cool kid in class that all the landlords want to play with. Um, they have. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Uh, it's kind of the new cool kid in class that all the landlords want to play with. Um, it's usually a uh, about pretty big uh, structural projects. So that can be elevators being replaced, new gyms being added to the buildings, boilers being replaced. Um, it's also uh, quite a new law. Um, so there's a lot of questions about how it's supposed to be interpreted. What's the correct statutory interpretation? And if you ever get involved in this, you will be reading uh, a lot of maintenance manuals as well. So you can look forward to that. Um, just to talk a little bit about the basics uh, of additional rent increases for capital expenditures, it was put into effect in July 2021. Uh, tenants can expect to face a maximum of 3% a year for three years uh, as a result of an application. So. It comes out to close to a total of like 10% maximum rent increase over the years. A little bit more, a little bit less, depending on how you want to add cumulative interest together with the normal rent increase that happens. Um, uh, the rent increase is never removed or taken back, even once the landlord has been fully repaid for the the things that he has done. Um, this is a question that many tenants have, even MLAs. Uh, a lot of People seem to be most offended about this part, which I actually don't personally care that much about. But the fact that the uh, that that landlord can essentially profit more than the cost of the repair seems unfair to a lot of people. So you'll probably get a lot of questions about this if you deal with it. The answer is no; they never stop. Um, whatever amount the landlord is claiming has to be spread on every unit and then divided by 120, representing all of the um, representing 10 years and uh, the, the 10 years that it's supposed to be paid off in. And uh, it requires that the landlord has improved, repaired or maintained uh, the property in some way. Um, so for this presentation, I'm just going to start with, you know, a little bit about the basic, like what do you do when you get an application on your desk, when a tenant calls you and then towards the end of the application uh, presentation we'll get into a little bit more of the nitty-gritty of uh, the specific um, rules in the act um, so the first thing you need to consider uh, when a tenant calls you is uh, where in the process is the tenant contacting you because unlike most rtb hearings which is just you know one application and one hearing uh, usually uh, additional rent increases uh, for capital expenditure uh, doesn't work that way. There'll usually be a preliminary hearing, uh, then an interim decision setting the rules for the main hearing, and then one to three main hearings typically in my uh, experience. Um, so the best thing you can do is if you come in before the preliminary hearing, uh, this is um, the, the, you will have the most, chance to shape the application and the best chance to to fight the landlord if you get in before the preliminary hearing unfortunately due to the way that um rtb words the uh, dispute resolution invitation or wh whatever you want to call it the the package that the tenants get uh, when they are informed of the application and the preliminary hearing makes the preliminary hearing sound very unimportant they'll say like you know, no facts will be heard. It's not about the material. You don't have to upload evidence. 
you can attend if you want. It's make, mainly about, you know, case management. Um, so a lot of tenants either uh, will not skip it or will show up to it completely unprepared. Um, so most times tenants will contact you after this point. Um, but if you can, you definitely want to be involved prior to the preliminary hearing. Then this is where you will typically, uh, in my opinion, enter the situation is tenants went to the preliminary hearing. They were surprised by what happened. They're like, well, they just told me it wouldn't, nothing important would happen. And now like a bunch of tenants can't speak at the next hearing. And like he made a, the arbitrator made a bunch of decisions that I don't agree with and I need some help. Um, so um, that's where you want to, that's where the tenant will typically um, intervene. And the reason I've made a space between the preliminary hearing and the interim decision is that typically it will take quite a long time between the preliminary hearing for the interim decision to come out. First of all, because they will typically have to find a two and a half hour time slot for the main hearing, which there's usually like a six to seven months wait on at the RTB. Uh, and also um, the landlord has to serve the decision on every tenant and they're typically given like 30 days to do so. Plus, you know, it can take a month or two to get the decision sent to the landlord. So you can sometimes have up to three months and then I've even been in cases where the landlord just forgets that they have to serve the interim decision. Um, so what I always recommend is like, if you're contacted in this uh, situation, uh, you grab the tenant, you call the RTB, you say like, hey, I was part of a preliminary hearing like two weeks ago. Uh, do you have a decision from the arbitrator on file? Because typically they will have the uh, arbitrator on file. They will have the decision on file, just not sent out yet. And you can get that sent right to you. And as we'll get in into later, like these cases take a lot longer and a lot more preparation than normal RTB hearings. So you really want to make sure you get yourself as much time as possible to prepare. Um, so it can be important to have that interim decision a couple of months earlier so you you can schedule you can plan your scheduling better uh, and then of course you can come in after the in now the tenant has gotten the interim decision they maybe realize that they're not allowed to speak or that like they only have a couple of weeks to gather their evidence um, and if you come in here um, I'll say you know see how long it is but if if it's like if the evidence deadline is one or two weeks away, you really need to consider if you have the capacity because you probably need to spend like, again, depending a little bit on the application, but I spent maybe like around 50 hours on an application. Uh, so a lot of advocates don't just like random, can't just rip 50 hours out of their calendars in two weeks, right? Uh, so you need to be pretty, if you want to commit to it, you need to, have a pretty open uh, schedule if you only have like one or two weeks to respond. Otherwise, when tenant contacts me so late, typically myself, I just give them advice and I say like, I'm sorry, you know, I wish I could help you, but uh, there's no way I can do like a responsible job with only like one or two weeks to the evidence deadline is not possible. Um, so another thing, as I said, um, again, because these applications are a lot larger than what you will typically do at the RTB is you need to assess what's your meaningful chance of success. Um, you, you really need to um, understand whether or not you can win this and whether or not, you know, the hours you spend on this is worth it because for myself, right, I'm sure we all have a lot of um, people that we reject because we don't have the time to do it and in the time that I could do maybe one of these I can maybe do like five or six eviction hearings right so you really don't want to be doing this without if you don't think you can win it um, and the first thing um, you want to do is assess like what's the type of work the landlord is doing how core is it to like the idea of additional rent increases so for example stuff like 
repairing the elevator or like um, um, replacing a boiler or um, repairing the foundation, like a cracked foundation. Obviously, these things are very core, so they're going to be more difficult to fight because uh, there are typically repairs that needs to be done. Um, whereas, you know, and I want to say these are all real examples I've seen. You know, it can be uh, in the other end, we have like flower beds to improve the security of the property, um, bike lockers, um, snow blowers. Um, there's a lot of things that like it's just not really connected to what the core idea of an ARIC is. And, and those things can be very expensive. So it can be a lot of money. I even see like art in the lobby. Uh, that's something I've seen a landlord try to do for an additional rent increase for capital expenditure. So, I mean, obviously that one, you're going to be like, okay, well, that one's going to be a pretty good chance to win, right? Because uh, that would be difficult to, for the landlord to succeed on. So, so that's the first thing I always look at is like, okay, how legit are the repairs that the landlord has done? Second is you want to try to find out like how organized are the tenants uh, and are there any long-term tenants because typically um, these repairs and these systems that fail have been failing or have been in the unit for many, many years, 10, 20, 30 years maybe. And if you have long-term tenants, if you have uh, organized tenants, it's going to be a lot easier to collect evidence and witnesses in regards to the landlord's failure to maintain this um, this thing that the landlord is requesting to repair. Whereas like if the only tenant that contacts you is someone who moved in like six months ago, he won't be able to provide any testimony to like the boiler installed in like 2001 that the landlord maintained that well, right? He'll have zero idea. And as a result, you might also have zero idea. Um, so you want to consider, yeah, and, and something I personally do is often if I get a building like this, you know, if I get like 100 or 200 uh, plus building, I reach out to some community resources. I only do work in Vancouver, so I'm lucky to have the Vancouver Tenants Union. Uh, and I don't know about, you know, the resources in more remote regions of the BC, but if there is anything like an organization for tenants, sometimes they'll be able to come in and help and, you know, do the boots on the ground, knock on the door, find out if you can find these like long-term tenants that might have an idea of what's been going on in the building. Uh, um, the second thing, the last thing you want to, of course, evaluate is like, what's the individual impact on the tenant? Sometimes in these very big buildings if the repairs are um not super expensive they're maybe only facing like a three to five maybe ten dollar rent increase and you know obviously there are maybe more important things to do than stopping tenants from receiving a ten dollar rent increase not that it's necessarily fair or okay but you know just from a from a from a you know most bang for your advocacy box like where where you hit the most you want to you want to you know evaluate how how much do i gain by winning this am i maintaining people in their housing are they being priced out if i don't do this and so on uh, and kind of in relation to this um you want to talk about like what is the landlord claiming for versus what is the maximum rent increase the tenants can face so um, sometimes, so as I said, the maximum is 3% per year for three years. So for example, I had a building where uh, I think around 40 tenants, average rent between 1,000 to 1,300 rent. They were facing a total rent increase of around $350 per unit, what is what would be allowed under the ARIC. But of course, their cap is a lot lower. Uh, their cap is around $30 per year for three years um which is 90 dollars. so the landlord was had the right to claim for triple of what um the maximum rent increase they could face was so then i looked at the application and i said well there's a lot of bad stuff in here i was in my head i was like i could probably if i take this case i can probably wipe out 50 percent, maybe even like 75 percent of what the landlord is asking for 
but the problem for that case was the remaining 25% still hit the cap on the rent increase. So effectively, even if I got 75% of the application dismissed, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have changed anything. The rent increase would be the same. Um, so it's important to understand that, like, in cases like that, right? It's like not just how. So it's like, is what I'm doing actually useful in the end? Even if, you know, it is everyone would say like, oh well, I I wiped a million dollars off what the landlord is claiming. That would be a a big deal. But if the rent increase is the same, then it it doesn't matter because if the five hundred thousand that's left is enough to every tenant to hit the cap, then you didn't do anything at all. Even though it sounds like you did a lot, right? Um, so uh, that's something to. Uh, be concerned about as well and you know lastly i just want to reiterate that these cases take a lot of time a lot of space and so to responsibly do an application where you can actually say you do your best effort you do need to have a lot of time on your plate um yeah and so just to get into now we're starting to get into more of the nitty-gritty uh, so the preliminary hearing um if you haven't done any ARICs, the chances as an advocate you've never attended one. Um, it is intended to be about case management, and it mostly will be. There isn't going to be anything about evidence there. Typically, your tenant won't even have an upload code. Um, but if you are, and we will talk about some documents that might need to be submitted by you anyway, you can get it in um, by submitting it to the RTB email the general email for the RTB and then asking them to add it to the file. Uh, but just be aware that like typically that takes, I mean, last time I emailed the RTB, they emailed me back saying like, well, we take at least three weeks to respond to an email. Um, so just be aware, you'll, you'll probably have to do this pretty far ahead of the uh, RTB, uh, the preliminary hearing, if you want a chance for the documents to actually appear on the uh, be before the arbitrator um so one of the first things that will be decided is is this hearing going to be written only going forward or are we going to have uh, oral arguments uh oral presentations as well so if i'm only giving advice to tenants i would generally advise them not to agree to do a writing only because if you have a tenant who is not you know trained going up against the landlord's lawyer, that difference will be exacerbated if it's in writing only, uh, because they haven't, you know, they have no experience doing written submissions. They don't have, they haven't perhaps ever in their life done, you know, a logical argument. And, you know, if there's things you miss in your written submissions, there's no way to correct it. If you realize it at the hearing that there's something you wanted to talk about, because there isn't going to be a hearing. Uh, it's just going to be decided on the, on the written merits um uh so that's uh usually the biggest thing that will be decided if whether it's going to be written or oral of course oral can be um i will say it can be a little bit dangerous also for the tenant it's not only advantages for the tenant because um landlords can as you know at the rtb you don't have to inform the other party that you're bringing witnesses and you don't have to uh, say anything about what those witnesses could potentially talk about. So uh, times where I've experienced where I'm on the back foot is that like, I have no idea the landlord has submitted no expert reports, nothing, right? I'm going in blind. I basically have nothing but their invoices. And then at the hearing, some architect or in structural engineer or something shows up and testifies to the landlord's application. And I I mean, one, you could object on procedural fairness grounds, right? You know, but if you, uh, but it can be dangerous because he has a sense of authority uh, in lieu because of his job. Uh, you know, the, the arbitrator will be probably very persuaded by what he says about the project. And it can be hard to think of counter arguments or uh, come up with a good, like, um, investigative questions to him on the spot so it can be an advantage to 
request everything going in writing because then you'll have a chance to respond to everything that the landlord submit and you'll usually have uh, time to think about the arguments look through the documents see if there's anything in the documents that pokes holes in their arguments um, so definitely a calculated risk because as well you might also you know want the tenants to give testimony usually testimony is better than an affidavit uh, and you might also have expert witnesses you know because um because there are so many tenants involved, you know, in this case, you can reach out to the tenants and be like, hey, do any of you know a plumber? Do any of you know like a structural engineer or something? So in this case, because the network of people affected is much larger, you might be able to get some expert witnesses of yourself and maybe you want to surprise the landlord with them. So a lot of considerations, but um, but this is one of the primary things that will be decided at the preliminary hearing. Uh, it's also uh, most likely your only chance to communicate uh, with the arbitrator prior to the hearing, including requesting uh, a summons for evidence. We'll talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but just realize like, if you want the landlord to submit documents, this is where you're going to be able to do that, uh, where you're going to be able to get an order from that. Once this preliminary hearing is over and you're like, oh, we never asked the landlord to submit maintenance manuals or submit the maintenance records, um, you're uh, probably not going to be able to contact an arbitrator to get an order for that. Um, at least I have never been able to. Um, something I just want to warn you guys about, uh, specifically because I've had it tried to me and I know other tenant uh, advocates that I have advised is that sometimes the arbitrator will try to get you to agree to represent everyone the entire building he'll be like oh you i am naming you the representative of the building uh first of all most tenants won't even be at the hearing you won't have talked to most of them and certainly you don't want to be a representative for like 211 people of which you've talked to three uh, that's not a good thing to do from a liability standpoint I just want to tell everyone that like the arbitrator has no power to do that. Even if he writes it in his decision, it's no, you know, no force and effect. He can't bind you to represent people you don't have a retainer agreement with. Um, but this will happen. It can even be happened to a tenant, but specifically if one of the tenants have an advocate, um, they have been pressured to, and I had have questions from advocates saying like, hey, in the interim decision, the arbitrator made me responsible for all the tenants. I haven't like talked to most of them and I haven't even agreed to be at the main hearing. I, I don't know why he did that. And, you know, so just, just be careful, make it clear that you're only representing one or a group of tenants. Usually the way I conduct these things, I will only represent one tenant because the arguments is gonna be general about the building. So if you win for one tenant, you win for everyone. So there's no need to represent more tenants, uh, essentially, uh, unless, you know, there's a specific reason that you want to be able to communicate with more than one person all the time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a little worse for your stats, if people care about that. But I think the simplest way is to just represent one person. And be aware that if your tenant doesn't show up that tenant will most likely be cut off from making oral submissions at the main hearing even if it's oral going forward in every decision i've seen arbitrators will cut off everyone every tenant that didn't show up at the hearing she will usually say well the people who showed up can do an oral arguments at the next hearing everyone who didn't show up you can give written submissions maximum five pages um something like that that has happened in every interim decisions i've seen so if you miss the preliminary hearing uh, and the hearing is going to be oral you will sorry the tenant will not be able to make oral submissions at the hearing now the way you can get around this uh successfully kind of if that tenant is important for you as a witness is that you can represent another tenant that was present at the hearing and then you can call the tenant you really want to talk to that was cut off as a witness because that's not cut off. Um, so that's kind of like a way you can get them back into the hearing if they have something important to say. So, um, yeah. Um, and uh, just talking about like what you would want to do 
uh, prior to the and this presentation is on get or shed whatever it's called by the way um so um this is not our template letter yet we are working on one just to be clear this is not a final copy or anything i just wanted to like talk about what i usually write to the landlord um so i usually write them uh you know hey i'm representing this tenant in relation to this hearing can you please um send me the following can you please put into evidence the following documents and in this particular case where i used this one uh, it was about a boiler uh, so for example what i wanted to know from the landlord is what was the make and model of the original boiler uh, what was the date the original boiler was installed because you want to know how long has it been in service that's important uh, the make and model is important because you want to be able to get the maintenance manual. Uh, you want to get the any and all manuals for maintenance included with the replaced heating boiler. And I just want to say, like, even, even if the landlord gives you a maintenance manual, just double check with the manufacturer because um, I unfortunately had to read not one but two boiler manuals because the arbitrator gave me the wrong one and i didn't realize until i was done with reading the first one uh, and you don't really want to submit yourself to that um so and and manufacturers are usually pretty pretty fast like i i just emailed the random boiler manufacturer i said like hey i have a model this and this and this in my residential building i uh, lost a manual for it can you send me one and they they sent me one so that's something you can do and it's something that you should do uh, then um, a maintenance record of all repairs and maintenance done to the building this is probably the most important because you want to compare you know the maintenance manual uh, to the maintenance that was actually done and see how well they overlap uh, and then <clears throat> Lastly, you want to get any and all complaints received from tenants in order in relation to inadequate heating, right, in this case. But like in other cases, you know, you want to get any complaints that you think is reasonable to whatever you're doing. For example, if it's concrete repairs, it could be like, well, have anybody ever complained about the parkade? Um, or if it's windows, it's like, well, has anyone ever complained about like the windows still being, because you might want to show that the landlord ha uh, has taken inaction, right? Like he knew this was an issue for a long time and he's been letting it get worse because that's one of the, as we'll get to, that's one of the defenses against um, the, an application for additional rent increases. Um, so, um so there'll be things that are the landlord's burden of proof and things that are the uh tenant's burden of proof uh, so uh the landlord's burden of proof is you know how much did they pay for the capital expenditures this will typically be uh the only evidence you'll get at the preliminary hearing because they'll give you a number and they'll submit like a bunch of invoices um i'll say myself when i got them i was shocked how little information is on these invoices even if they're for like a large amount of money it can be like uh just it can be like i saw an invoice for like four hundred thousand dollars and the only note was like repair <laughs> it's like okay <laughs> thank you um um so they have the burden to prove that you know the repair maintenance and installation was actually done typically this will also be pretty uncontroversial like because they are big things you know they're not faking building a gym or like replacing the elevator or so typically you will not be arguing that they didn't do the work that they're saying they did um then uh, we come to a more interesting one and this will will get back to this one uh, is that they have the burden to prove that it was a major system or component uh, of the building um, now uh, the wonderful guideline 37 uh, has a very 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 wide definition of what is a major component or system um, and so typically the landlord can try to fit even the most ridiculous things uh, in under this. Like, you know, he can say stuff like, well, uh, because um, 
the definition of a major system or is like anything that's integral to the property okay to the residential property okay that's nice we can all that sounds reasonable but then there is an or that says or uh to providing facilities or services to the tenant and and that last uh, phrase of that line in the legislation really opens up for basically anything to go you can be like well i'm providing a gym to the tenants you can't have a gym without gym equipment so that's integral to providing the service of a gym to the tenants so i'm making the tenants pay for all my new gym equipment uh you can do it with you know Oh, I need a snowblower because it's integral to the tenants that they can access the landscaping during winter, which is a service I'm providing, uh, right? So, and, you know, it, it all sounds dumb, but it's in the legislation, if you read the guideline, it's actually not that easy just to say like, no, that's ridiculous. Uh, because in a sense, it is integral, right? Like you can't walk in the landscaping without a clear path. You can't go to a gym without equipment. Um, uh, so, yeah, a um, little bit difficult, but we'll, we'll, I'll have a, there's a separate slide for this, so we'll get to. Uh, then um, that the, they have the proof to prove that the replacement repair and installation fulfills the necessary requirements. So um, those requirements are, there are three different one. ones. Is, one is to maintain the health and safety of the building. One is to replace something that's at the end of its useful lifetime. Um, and uh, there are two more, which is um, to imp improve the security of the building and to uh, make the building more uh, energy efficient. Um, those are sort of the requirements for, for doing the installations. Um, they also have the burden to prove that the capital expenditures were incurred within 18 months of the date of which the landlord makes the application. And this is a, tenants will typically spend a lot of energy on this one, um, wrongfully in my opinion, um, because they will be like, these are often large projects, so they might take multiple years. So sometimes the initial payments are outside of the 18 months window, but the project is completed within the 18 months window. And as much as I hate to say the phrase, I agree with landlords, uh, I do unfortunately agree with landlords that the most reasonable interpretation of the law is that it's within 18 months of the finishing of the project, um, because otherwise our landlords might have to make like several ARI applications for a single project. And that gets really weird with like the rules of how they can implement the additional rent increases and like how how often they can do it and stuff like that. So uh, unfortunately, I think if the final payment is within the 18 months, then it's okay to go. Um, and they have the burden to prove that the capital expenditures will not be occurred again uh, for the for at least five years. Um, so that's just to sort of prevent basic maintenance from being included in the request they can do. Of course, if basic maintenance only happens, only is needed every five years, then they can include it. So that's wonderful. Um, so in um, the policy guideline 37, uh, landlords are um, encouraged, but not required, uh, to put into evidence the following documents. Uh, so photographs of and videos taken of the repair and the replacement, copies of permits obtained, copies of relevant law, expert reports. Um, and you will notice that the documents asked for here um, is closely mirrors the request for evidence that I made. Um, the Basically, the documents I'm asking for in all the requests for evidence I send out is basically just a copy of this section of uh, uh, guideline 37. I think that's good for two reasons. One, arbitrators don't really like to give out summons for evidence. It's probably not something they're very comfortable with or have done very often. And two, 
um, it's going to be stronger if the landlord doesn't provide the argument and you need to make an argument of like adverse inference. That is to say that like the landlord is withholding information that's bad for him and he should be, it should be interpreted as if that, is bad like that the that the that the reason that since he's not providing the maintenance records we should assume that he hasn't done the correct maintenance for example um so it's going to be stronger when you're in front of the arbitrator and you say like hey look arbitrator i specifically one they're encouraged to supply these documents under 37 I specifically asked for him in a letter sent on this and this date well before the evidence deadline. And he has not done it or refused to do it. For the, all those reasons, I think we can assume that the landlord didn't do his maintenance and that's why he didn't put in the maintenance records. Um, so by following the guideline 37, you just get a little bit of extra strength to all of those arguments because you know arbitrators like to lean heavily on guidelines because it makes their job easier um so adding that extra strength to like why uh, the landlord should submit these documents or why it should be counted against him when he didn't do it is is very good and i want to talk um a little bit about uh policy guideline 40 uh, for those who don't know, that policy guideline is called uh, the useful lifetime of building elements. Uh, so it's basically a guideline that says uh, paint lasts for four years, concrete lasts for 10 years, boilers last for 15 years, um, and so on. Every part of a building or house has a specific number of years that's its useful lifetime. Um, and landlords are very uncritically landlords and uh, arbitrators i should say are uncritically using this to evaluate the lifetime of building elements in these uh, very large buildings typically and it's important to know first of all policy guideline 40 is supposed to include like all buildings right so like from your single basement suite to your uh, downtown skyscraper right and obviously like the elements you use in those two different houses will have rapidly different lifetimes, uh, but that's not accounted for in the policy guideline. And and typically, um, in my experience, the, the numbers in the policy guideline is lower than the ex life expectancy of the elements used in like large multi hundred unit buildings. Um, for example, uh, personally, I had a um, situation where the landlord tried to use the 15-year uh, guideline for boilers in the policy guideline 40, uh, but I had contacted the manufacturer. And I was like, well, the manufacturer says this boiler is good for like 25 to 30 years before it needs replacement. So, and the landlord had replaced it after year 19 so his argument is like, well, it's useful lifetime is all already over. It's been over for four years. So like, even if I didn't do my maintenance, uh, it, it's okay to replace it because it didn't fail early because my failure to do maintenance. Whereas the reality was that like, it's supposed to last for 25 to 30 years and it failed six to uh, 11 years early because the landlord didn't do their maintenance, right? So, um be very critical um, about policy guideline 40. Um, I would almost always object to its use unless it's in favor of your tenant. <laughs> I, I would from a, yeah, from a, so, um, so just, just so you know that, uh, I think that's very important. Um, again, just the thing, reach out to manufacturers if you can, if you can't, and if you can't find anything, you know, you can say like, look, the landlord must have this information. No one spends like 1.6, for example, million dollars replacing an elevator without knowing how long that elevator is going to last. Like that's not, that's just not something that happens in business. So the landlord has the real number. They're choosing you use the policy guideline number because it's more favorable, right? And the arbitrator should, I think any reasonable arbitrator would agree with that, that like, if you spend that much money installing something, 
you're going to get like a guarantee or a warranty or an indication of like how long you can expect this thing to last. And like the reason that the landlord's not using that thing is because it's longer than the tenancy, um, than the guideline in the tenancy policy guideline. Um, because if it was shorter, obviously they would include it. Um, so yeah, that's just to say, uh, be critical of policy guideline for these use in ARIC cases, especially in cases of large multi-story buildings. Um, So uh, we'll get to the tenant's burden of proof in a second, but the main defense you have against the landlord's use is that, so a landlord cannot be granted a, a monetary order for, or like again, cannot be granted a capital expenditure if the land tenant can prove that one, they didn't, that the thing failed because of the landlord's inadequate maintenance, uh, or if they are entitled to be paid by someone else. Um, but the entitled to be paid from someone else is a pretty rare occurrence. So most of the time, what you're going to be struggling about is has the landlord done their maintenance? And the first thing you need to figure out is, well, what sort of maintenance requirements are there? Um, I could tell you all the maintenance requirements for boilers, uh, but I will spare you. Uh, <laughs> um, but for example, in some cases, it can be very difficult uh, to maintain, to get an idea of like what sort of, what are the standards of maintenance? It's something I've struggled with a lot, especially uh, I've dealt with a number of like parkade restorations, uh, like, um, parking structures um, from the 70s being replaced or repaired and then the landlord applying for an additional rent increase for capital expenditures. And, and you know, you can't just look up, you know, like maintenance manual parkade, you know, and you won't, you won't get any results on Google. Uh, I, I promise you that even if you go to page 10, you know, <laughs> Desperately clicking next page, maybe it'll come, maybe there'll be something here, but it, it won't come. Uh, and the same thing for like, you know, maintenance manual concrete, you know, you won't really find anything there. So um, it can be very difficult to to get the maintenance. Basically, you, you might need to get an expert witness. You might have to hope that a tenant knows someone in the construction industry or like know someone in the like in the management building industry and that you can call upon them if the landlord doesn't do their duty and you know give you that information uh, so that you can work with that um so um the second thing you need to prove is or you need to understand is like did the lack of maintenance um cause the failure of the system uh like most of the time of course if it's an accident you can say like it didn't you know like let's say the landlord didn't maintain the roof but a meteor hit it uh obviously in that case the lack of the landlord's maintenance is not what caused the roof roof to collapse um uh, but there can be like more complicated cases where like if they for example um in a boiler, if they didn't um, if they didn't do proper maintenance on some parts of the boiler, but it was the other parts of the boiler that failed. Uh, for example, if they there's something called like a flame disc uh, <laughs> in boilers that they have to uh, resurface every four thousand hours. Uh, let's say they have they have done that, uh, but then. Uh, maybe it's the piping or something else that fails uh, because of acidification of that. Uh, you know, um, you it's not necessarily connected that you know the the failure of the the flame. And I know I'm getting a little detailed here, but just to you know prepare you for what you're going in for. Um, it's those two things are not necessarily connected. Of course, you you'll try to make general arguments. You know, like if you're not servicing one part, you know, like if it was a car, if you're not servicing one part that can cause damage to other parts, right? Like you'd assume that a machine that's running poorly because some parts are not working, that 
could cause damage to other parts. And I think that's a reasonable argument, but just, but just be prepared that you do have to make that connection in your arguments that, you know, the failure of the maintenance is connected to the failure of the um, system. Uh, you should read the landlord's expert testimony very carefully. Um, so experts, they, you know, they're hired by the landlord to do the project. So they'll generally, you know, speak in their favor. Uh, so like you, you kind of want to read the, between the lines sometimes, like what aren't they saying? Like what have they not talked about? Uh, and sometimes they will also, you know, let something slip that maybe the landlord doesn't think is important or something. For example, I had a case with um, the... Uh, and out and a, a fire exit stair for the entire building being replaced and um the um the the expert had said that like well the maintenance from the landlord was good uh but also in one of their like deeper letter steps where they explained why they had to do it they had stated just in one sentence you know that like well actually this is due to like uh, inferior sloping uh, by the original person who installed the stairs. Uh, so that like the, the stairs had been angled slightly wrong, which apparently causes buildup of water and, you know, can cause early deterioration. So some things like that, just, just read it word for word. Don't just think that like, oh, because he's hired by the landlord, he's not going to say anything useful. Um, read it word for word, read what he's not saying. Um, because like some of them won't testify to the maintenance. They'll just say like it was needed, which is actually just usually not in contention. Like, yes, the boiler broke down. We need a new boiler, right? No one, no one cares. Um, uh, yeah, I already said that get the manufacturers manable. Don't rely solely on the landlord. Uh, I think there's a lot of gray areas as it is a new legislation. Um, one key thing that I haven't seen in any decisions yet uh, is that like, I think the legislation opens up for like a partial award. Like if the landlord did, did failed because of the maintenance, but it would have had to be replaced pretty soon anyway. So then it seems like in the legislation, there's a door um, open for, you know, like 50% of the cost or 25% of the cost, uh, because it talks about like a roof repair and it's only the extra damage from the lack of maintenance that should be, um, it, it's a little bit hard to, to work out even like how would an, how would an arbitrator find that? How would the evidence work for that? Um, in my cases, I've only seen, uh, items being fully granted or fully dismissed. Um, so. Unfortunately, I can't speak to how this is going to be worked out by arbitrators, but just be aware that it's a possibility that there might be some partial awards um, for it. Um, so tenants burden of proof, um, as I said, we've just talked about the inadequate maintenance and repair. The second one is that the landlord has been entitled to be paid from another source for part or all of the capital expenditures. Um, typically, those two things will be one, grants from the government for uh, making the building more energy efficient, which is one of the things they can do capital expenditures for, and two, uh, for potentially insurance or damage claims against uh, someone else. So, for example, in the case with the stairs, the landlord might have a potential claim against the original installer of the stairs because he did that improperly. He was perhaps negligent in inadequately sloping the stairs. So the landlord could go after them for the damages of they had as a result of that. And they shouldn't be allowed to just choose to go after the tenants because it's easier. Um, the same thing with like insurance. If they have insurance that might be able to cover the repairs, uh, typically more in the accidents case, not the maintenance, but um, then they could also do that. Um, and in regards to grants, like, um, and, you know, I'm sorry to keep talking about boilers, but for example, uh, BC Hydro has a 
grant if you place a low efficiency boiler with a high efficiency boiler you can get money for that um city of vancouver has some grants for if you make your building more energy efficient um i'm sure um it can be a little bit hard to get an overview of all the grants, um, but um, just know that that possibility is there. Typically, again, if it's about the energy efficiency of the building, um, uh, and the landlord has to apply if they could apply. If they just didn't apply, didn't get money, even if so, then you should. I assume you should work on the fact that we should intend that they applied and got the grant and then the money of the grant should be deducted from what they're claiming against the tenants. Um, so that can be important in, you know, uh, and I'm sure, you know, more and more climate adoptions are going to be made or, and are going to be forced on landlords. And in many of those cases, I'm sure there will be grants available. So I've, I think this will be a growing area. And I think we will see in the coming years, a lot of, uh, applications in this space uh, so i know i have talked to the city of vancouver about like making a a general portal where you can see like all of the sort of grants uh, that the landlord are typically able to apply for um and you know they they haven't finished that yet but you know hopefully um resources like that you know contact your local city their offices might know about it more um Generally, it's as I've said, it's difficult for, and as the picture shows, it can be difficult for tenants to obtain the necessary evidence. Almost all of the documents you want to use are solely in the possession of the landlord. First, because tenants don't know that there's going to be a capital expenditure claim until after the work is done. So typically they won't have pictures of the situations before they probably won't have pictures of the work being done and they they have no idea this application is coming. Uh, so they won't do their evidence like prior to the application. Then all of the arguments like, you know, that I've talked about, like uh, what's the make and model, what's the uh, maintenance manual, what's the maintenance records, uh, what's the expert reports. All of those are documents you cannot get. They're not publicly available. They're only possessed by the landlord. So it's very, um, the only way you can get it, it's basically through a summons from the arbitrator, which is already difficult to obtain. Uh, so the evidence can be very sparse. I. I have a hearing in two days where like the only thing the landlord has submitted is the invoices. Nothing else, no pictures, no maintenance, nothing. And, you know, I'm still, you know, it, it may be enough, right? You, we, we don't know. Uh, but, and I, as a result, I don't have any evidence to submit. The only thing I've counter submitted is like my request to the landlord to submit these documents into uh, evidence because I have no nothing else. Like a lot of these systems are also in areas of the building where the tenants don't have access, right? So they can't go down and see the make and model of the boiler. They don't know what type of concrete was poured. It doesn't, you know, there's not like a, a plague on the concrete stating its model and make, you know, um, and electrical wiring is hidden from the tenants as well. Right. So, so, it can be very, very difficult to get evidence, um, which if we loop it back to one of the earlier slides, sometimes can make it very difficult to ascertain whether or not you have a good case. Uh, so, you know, sometimes you have to take a case on, you know, just, you know, faith that the, maybe that the tenant story is true, uh, that the, that the, that the landlord hasn't done their maintenance and you're just hoping that you know that evidence will come in from the landlord but you know sometimes it doesn't come into like 20 days before the hearing and then you have to respond 10 days before the hearing um that's another thing i just wanted to i for, i now realize i forget to mention that like in the interim decisions there will usually be custom deadlines for the evidence 
uh, for the main hearing. So they will not be using the ordinary RTB deadlines uh, for when you have to submit evidence. Uh, so just be careful about that. Don't just think like, oh, the hearing is on you know, uh, November 14th, I have the standard 15 days plus, you know, five days for registered mail. Uh, sometimes uh, some of the hearings I've had had like deadlines for evidence like 30 days before the hearing. Uh, so it can be uh, quite a long time before. So you just need to make sure you don't just go into automatic mode and be use those standard uh, deadlines at the RTB. Um, yeah, as I said before, consider if any tenants know any experts. Uh, so now um, we'll get into a little bit more of the, I don't know if I want to say philosophical, but uh, <laughs> certainly theoretical part of the presentation in regards to statutory interpretation of what a major system or component is. Um, as I said before, um, it's a very wide definition in policy guideline 37. I'll just read it out. It is uh, an electrical system, mechanical system, structural system, or similar system that is integral to the residential property or to providing services to tenants and occupants. The, ma the term major component means a component of the residential property that is integral to the property of a significant component of a major systems. And major systems and major components are typically things that are essential to support or enclose a building, protect its physical integrity, or support a critical function of the residential property. Examples of major systems are, um, you know, load-bearing walls. Okay, we, I think we can all agree on that. Um, parking structures, um, and so on. It goes on to list a lot of things that, in my opinion, are not uh, essential or major systems. Um, uh, I think the only thing I with confidence can say is excluded is individual problems in one tenant's unit. And that is of course uh, not a lot of things that are excluded from that, but that's just due to how wide of a definition that is in, in uh, policy guideline 37. Uh, another thing that's not allowed uh, is cosmetic upgrades are not allowed by themselves. So for example, art in the lobby uh, or painting of the building uh, or um, upgrading, um, yeah, you know, planting flowers on the property or something like that. Something that doesn't serve a purpose outside of being cosmetically uh, relevant is not allowed. Uh, but the key word here in the policy guideline is not allowed unless it's part of something else. Uh, so for example, you can replace uh, vinyl floors in the lobby with hardwood floors. That would seems to be okay under the policy guideline. And then we start to get into um, um, or you, you know, you can replace a roof with a better roof, like a uh, um, but um, the part of becomes very spread out. So for example, we have, I had a situation where the landlord had to do concrete repairs on the building. That were, those were legitimate. I didn't object to those. Uh, but then at the same time that they had done the concrete repairs, they had also painted the entire building. And it turns out in the in the capital expenditure, the cost of the painting was about 70% of the application. Uh, so that was way more expensive than the concrete repairs. Um, and the landlord, um, unfortunately, I haven't, most of the cases I'm talking about, unfortunately, hasn't had decisions yet because the law is still new. So uh, I wish I could talk more about what conclusions arbitrators have made, but I guess I'll do that next year. Um, so. Um, the landlord is arguing, well, it happened at the same time, so it was part of the repairs of the concrete. And the standpoint uh, I take in regards to the legislation is that it's only part of something if it's inseparable from doing it. For example, you know, you're making a new roof. If yes, it might be of better material, but you know, it's an integral part of the roof. You, you can't separate the material from the roof. 
Um, and, a, and a good test that I have used in my arguments is like, if it's something that can be done at a different time, but it just happens to be done at the same time, then uh, that's not considered part of. For example, the landlord could have painted the building two years later, and it would 100% be a cosmetic upgrade that's not allowed. So just because they do it at the same time, it shouldn't suddenly be something that's part of um, the upgrade or the repair to the building. So um, that's an important argument. That's an important difference. I hope we get some good decisions in this area. Uh, but yeah, just um, the main thing I do in my head if I'm when I'm thinking about this uh, argument is like, could it have been done separately at a different time? And if so, yes, then it's not part of. That's uh, sort of my main argument in this area. And then um, <clears throat> there is a, uh, in my opinion, a gap between what's considered essential service and what's in considered integral to a major system. Uh, so essential services is found in the Residential Tenancy Act. You know, it's typically you'd say hot water, electricity, um, access to the unit itself, stuff like things where like the tenancy itself is completely non-functional if, uh, if it isn't done. Um, Whereas major systems, as we talked about, could through that thing like integral to providing services can expand to a lot of things that happen outside of the unit, such as gyms, uh, rooftop bars, uh, um, parkades, even though the tenants don't have parking, you know, not all the tenants have parking and so on. And the position I have taken is that like, um, and I this is, uh, incidentally will be the argument I'm, I'm going to raise on the hearing here in two days is that if something is not considered non-essential, it cannot be considered integral. Like those two things must be uh, separate. And I think a strong argument for that is that landlords are allowed to remove non-essential services from the tenant. So they can just give them a letter, say like, hey, I'm removing your services in 30 days. Uh, and they can do that legally. They'll have to reduce the rent a little bit, um, but they're generally allowed to do that. So under the legislation, it doesn't make sense to me that a landlord could, for example, um, apply for the repairs of the parkade, get a rent increase for those repairs, then terminate renting for all tenants in the building. The, there's no way to undo the rent increase so the rent increase stays and then they can turn the now new fresh you know new nice parkade into public parking and earn money that way uh, right like i don't think that's a reasonable interpretation of what they're trying to do under the act um so the argument uh, that i'm saying is like if it's a non-essential service that the landlord can just remove you know gym parking um other sorts of services that your community garden, uh, public spaces, uh, those sort of things um, shouldn't be allowed to count for major systems because then we have this weirdness where the landlord can charge tenants for something they can freely remove from them. Um, and yeah, just again, um, it's new legislation. A lot of these things haven't been tried. None of these things have been tried at Supreme Court. At best, they've been tried by other arbitrators. Uh, so there is a, a lot of gray areas and um, I'm sure we'll get a lot of updates on this uh, like in the coming years uh, as decisions start to, to come down. Um, and just to remember, um, so in regards to the essential service versus integral major systems, something I forgot to mention is that like, um, uh, the argument is complicated by the fact that policy guideline 37 says that parking, for example, is uh, considered an integral part. Uh, it, it says that in the policy guideline, but you, you have to, if that's the case, you have to engage in a more statutory interpretation and go like, well, you cannot make law in policy. 
So if the policy guideline goes against the act and the, re the a reasonable interpretation of the act and the regulation, then that part of the policy guideline should be struck. So like typically in your arguments, at least in my submissions, I have like, yes, I acknowledge that in the policy guideline, it says that this is an integral system, but this is a wrong interpretation of the act and the regulation and therefore arbitrator, first of all, you're not bound by the policy guideline. You're free to uh, make decisions that doesn't align with it. And second, even if you were bound by the policy guideline, you shouldn't follow it because it's in violation of the residential tenancy regulation and act in combination. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll have to see if those arguments hold, but I think it's a strong argument. And I think uh, if that argument hold that, you know, essential services, non-essential services cannot be integral services, uh, though that would, that would eliminate most of the, what I would consider abuse under this uh, rule, because you won't have tenants paying for gyms and parkades and art in the lobby and so on. You'd have them only paying for things that are actually essential to the use of their units, which, you know, it's still, I don't think landlords should be allowed to do this at all, but if they should be allowed, it should at least be somewhat restrained to the things that are essential to actually living in the housing. And yeah, if anybody has any questions, I think there is a little bit of time left. How many hearings have you had so far for capital expenditures? I think I've done full representation. So I appeared for four hearings and I've given pretty serious legal advice for like around another seven or so. Um, so as I said, I really hope there's not a advocate in the province that's done more because that would be damaging to their mental health. And has it been only for buildings or has it been basement suites? Um, so the the major actor I have seen on this is uh, is large corporate landlords, um, typically uh, multi-building landlords. Um, I have seen, I think I've only seen two for houses uh, where there lived multiple tenants. You know, you know uh, I don't want to, yeah you know, the typical house where they rent the rooms out to like five or six tenants. Uh, I have seen one application for repair of a deck and railing uh, for such a house. Uh, so it's not exclusive to the big, uh, big corporations, but just given how much, you know, it's not, it's not the easiest application to make. And uh, it, it is you know like you have to make the application at least you can't just ask tenants and then tenants have to fight it uh, so you as a landlord have to make the application there is that preliminary hearing you do have to serve a lot of documents on a lot of people so typically it's more used by the corporate landlords what i have seen from smaller landlords is a lot of landlords are threatening to do it saying like hey tenant i think i can uh, do a capital expenditure for $200. Uh, but, you know, if you just agree to an increase of $50, I won't do that. Um, so I've seen a lot of that from, from smaller landlords, um, especially, I mean, this is, I, my, my data is not that big, but especially if, for some reason, a lot of them are on the island uh, or like in, in smaller, smaller communities. Um, I don't know why that is, uh, but um, yeah. Um, so, so a lot of landlords are threatening with it, and you know, tenants aren't experts, so a lot of them are scared, and they read the legislation, or maybe they Google capital expenditures, and they just see the news, like, oh, it's a new thing landlords can do, and they're like, oh no, he can actually do this. Uh, but um, yeah, so so from smaller landlords, it's more the threat. The actual applications I'm seeing are more from. Uh, very large corporate actors, but perhaps once the legislation gets more settled and the corporate 
and you know it it you know there's a more, more the applications aren't as contentious because it becomes more clear what you can and cannot do then you know maybe landlord bc will put out some guidelines on it and maybe after that has come out smaller landlords will follow too um but but that remains to be seen thank you Just wondering if when you start getting some decisions, if you could just maybe post a couple of synopsis on um, PubNet or something that way we could just sort of get a gist. Yeah, uh, that's certainly a possibility. I we will probably also publish it on the track homepage because we are working on a, on a new page for capital expenditures. Uh, we're just a little hesitant to put it out there when there's so many gray areas because we don't want tenants to make poor decisions based on our online information but but that is yeah and uh, but that's a good idea and i already have one decision so i could i could upload that pretty soon already just so people can see what uh, what it's about i'll i'll do that yeah When you were going over the, your assessment of whether you're going to take a matter on or not, you said it, even if you could argue a significant part down, it might still be um, the tenant might still face the maximum amount. Okay, could you just elaborate a little on that, a maximum amount, because I'm not... Uh, grasping it yeah so as i said the, the case i had where this was the most relevant was a case of uh, all the windows in the building had been replaced um and due to the way the landlord had done it around i would say 60 percent of the replacement because it was two different projects had happened outside of the uh, 18 month window and it wasn't one project uh it was two separate projects by two separate uh contractors so i was like okay it's not the it's not one project uh so what as i said let's let's just uh, for easy math uh do the say that the tenants rent were 1000 right so the maximum they could face is 30 dollars every year for 3 years so 90 dollars in total um now this cost of this project was around two million dollars or something like that uh so split on every unit the landlord had the right to increase uh the the maximum the landlord could increase if you disregarded the tenants the cap on the rent increase he was allowed to increase the rent 341.2 dollars for uh every tenant right so 90 dollars and 341 that's a big gap right so even so like in that case even if i got two thirds of it struck it would still be around 100 dollars which is more than the 90 dollar cap so in that case even if i got two thirds struck it wouldn't have done anything for the tenants because they would still face the 90 dollar gap um so yeah that's just uh, something to to think about uh, because like you know for many advocates it will be like the biggest cases they've ever done right like and you you think in your head it's like oh wow i i just got like a, a million dollars struck from the landlord's application right you'd be like holy shit uh that's the most money i've ever <laughs> done at a hearing right and then for all of that just to be completely useless because the the rent cap is already is still reached with you know it's kind of a it's a very pyrrhic victory <laughs> Hi, I mean, I think a lot of the questions I'm hearing, um, like mine, are somewhat speculative because obviously there's there's been such little precedent, um, if you can call tenancy branch decisions that. Um, I I'm curious if you're seeing any interactions with other like tenancy applications from the same landlords. For example, um, have you seen landlords who have who might be doing this instead of rent eviction or who've attempted rent eviction, or maybe we will see that after like, obviously, you know, I'm in 
the um, Amon Sequat Mulu around Kamloops. And we're seeing a lot of landlords trying to turn over and raise rents because of the increase. I know you guys all know this, um, but I, I see this as a way to kind of alongside increased campaigns um, for cause for tenants who are being there for like 20 years where it's, you know, I don't think it's meeting that threshold, but then having these building improvements to raise rent. I'm just wondering how you see this fit with other, like, are you seeing landlords who have this pattern of, of other types of action against tenants? I hope that's specific enough, but like, they're also very, um, they also are very active trying to enforce for cause that's not real, or they might consider um, like applying to renovate that sort of thing. Is it, is it the same landlords? Um, I think actually my colleague uh, coined it gentrification or something like that. Uh, you know where they yeah as where they try to where they try to beautify the building and then those rent increases price uh, people out of the building. Um, I think um, at this point, it's probably not happening um, yet just because the rent increase, like I think most tenants can probably survive the first round of capital expenditures. And I don't think there's any tenant who has faced two rounds yet, but obviously it's going to be a concern, right? Because if you, first of all, if you know, you have to imagine that this is on top of the annual rent increase, right? So if a landlord were to make a new application every 18 months, and let's just say it stays at the 2%, uh, right? That's, um, that's now you're facing a 5% rent increase every year uh, for uh, forever, basically. That has like a doubling time of like around 14 years, if my math club skills are still intact uh but you know uh that's not something most people can keep up with uh so i think i think it will lead to a lot of people being priced out of their communities uh in regards to whether it's the same actors i will i can just say that i know there's one lawyer uh that's very active in this field who I think, I don't know if he's doing it pro bono or if the landlords are like not pro bono, but like if he wins, he gets some part or, or if the landlords are actually hiring him to do it. Uh, but I am seeing one prolific lawyer in this sense. And um, as I said, it's mainly the larger corporate uh, actors. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, I, I probably don't have the data to be like, they're also doing a lot of cost evictions together with this. I don't know. But I think uh, I think the real risk is um, over the years, if a landlord keeps doing this every 18 months, um, it won't take, it will take like maybe five or six years for a tenant to be priced out of his unit, right? Uh, so I think we will see a lot of that eventually happening. All right, thank you everyone for joining in the session. Watch your